Hello, everybody. This is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, Vid Dog Training, and I am the guy that works with dangerous dogs. Absolutely uh, love working with dangerous dogs. I love working with extremely dangerous, skittish, predatorial type dogs. It's something that really makes me feel great uh, to be able to work with a dog that is so dysfunctional that other people will say, just kill the dog. In my case, for me, I see life in every single dog. And I see the ability for each and every single dog to survive, no matter how dangerous, how predatorial, all these other things that make people like, uh, you know, master dog trainers afraid. These are the dogs that I work with. And every single life in this world is precious. And it's something that we don't seem to understand. And we lack the responsibility of accepting that every life is precious for us. Everything that we do is a privilege. It, 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 it's not a right. It's a privilege. A privilege to, to exist, uh, a privilege to have a job, a privilege to have a dog or a cat, a bird, uh, someone that is important to us in our life. That is what a dog is to us. That is what a cat is to us. That is what an animal is to us that we live with. And it is a privilege for us to be able to cohabitate cross species with just life, with, with a creature that is not human to be able to share these incredible journeys of ours. And I've had a few conversations in the past few days with people um, in regards to, to their dogs. And it's tough. A, a, a couple of people have uh, told me about how their dog is on um, starting to, to, to sunset, starting to reach for that rainbow bridge. You know, I've experienced it myself, as have most people who have had more than one dog in their life. The hurt that we feel inside leading up is, is so much anxiety and stress and worry. And we feel lost. And we feel lost even before anything happens. We feel lost at the thought of our beloved companion, our best friend, our loyal, loyal, loyalist friend starting to decline and the worst part is when it happens that's the worst part the worst part oh, sorry guys the, the 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 worst part is when it does finally happen and life is unavoidable there's absolutely nothing that can stop death we can we can fantasize about it we can pretend about it but there's nothing that will ever stop death. And I think the most important part is to be precious and to, to share and to enjoy what is um, fleeting. Stephen Hawking's, you know, a brief history in, in time, of time. Um, some of these things that we see were in and out, you know, one of the things that I did, I have always said, uh, and it's in my website where, where I talk about that, even if we were just random, you know, let, let me go and find this while, while I'm talking and, um, and then you understand uh, my reference point because it's, it's, <laughs> It's super sad. It's super sad. Um, let me look for it here. Um, um, but I should say, actually, just to preempt this thing, I should have said is uh, this is November 29th, 2019, episode number 42. Uh, I'm going to go over owner's question uh, about a reactive dog that needs help. And they sent me the email, and I uh, haven't even looked at it, so I'm going to put it up. Uh, it's in my description, and we'll talk about it. But the interesting thing this person um, says is that, that that their dog is reactive. It's a big dog. I think it's a great day, and I'm not sure. Um, 
and this dog is reactive and possessive and reactive as into the environment and, you know, consequential, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that this person wrote down, and you'll see it in the, dis the description here, is that she's not going to kill her dog. Right? She's not going to give up her dog. That's not going to happen. It just is not going to happen. And that is a preciousness of life. Understanding the privilege that we have, we still take that, that task, that essence, the, the, the reason, and we take that and we bring that for us into just really appreciating who and what we are as human beings and what our, our, uh, our dogs mean to us, our animals mean to us. So this is what I wrote down on my page uh, under uh, rfarfbarkbark.com under about us. Uh, and I posted this on my Facebook um, earlier this year. Here's the thing. Even if I was to think this world's existence is a random occurrence, and as such, everything I do could be argued as meaningless, I would still do what I'm doing because I am helping another life in a world that alone in this universe, we are absolutely insignificant, yet I would still do what I'm doing now, working with dogs, okay? Um, because and regardless, we're proof in this vast universe that we collectively possess the most powerful weapon in the universe. It's called compassion. And that is the... That is our existence. That is who we are, is compassion. We nurture, we support each other, we take care of each other, we love each other. And then somewhere along the line, when technology became more prevalent and everything became instantaneous, you send a text out, you expect a text response back within a minute. You download, uh, you go to watch a movie or something on YouTube and you expect it to start right away. If there's a data delay, you're just like, what the heck? Do people even, the younger generation even know what a rotary dial telephone is? We live in a, in a life of privilege, technologically driven species now. But it seems sometimes our compassion has uh, has gone to the wayside and, and you know it's not necessarily a, a criticism but it is just we need to kind of reconnect we need to kind of reconnect whether or not it's it's spiritual or or it's not but it's something we need to reconnect um yeah and and again uh rest in peace to the um to the furry loves that we have lost today. And um, it's a lot of dogs that die, you know, just naturally and, and otherwise. So I um, just want to say that. So I'm going to shift gears. Uh, I don't want to stay in this kind of funk, but unfortunately it's just been a kind of a uh, sad things and dogs have, you know, I, I told somebody, a few people actually, when I get contacted, uh, 10 out of 10 times when I get contacted, people are already right at the end of their uh, end of their line and they're desperate and they're phoning around and they're Googling and they're searching on Facebook for somebody who can deal with their reactive, aggressive, dysfunctional dog. And then they find out about me and they contact me. And the sad part is about 70%, 70% of those people have already made up their minds that they're going to kill their dog. They won't surrender to their dog. They won't accept responsibility. They will just kill their dog. It's a huge percentage for me to run into on a constant basis. Every single person I talk to in the back of my head is that concern that they will kill their dog. I had one person message me two months ago, uh, off and on, off and on about getting some training, never did any of the training and all that stuff. Then she ended up moving in with her boyfriend um, in Squamish 
and apparently the, her dog, who was somewhat reactive, and he knew that, the boyfriend knew this, uh, she was reactive to him in a bit and tried to nip at his face. So he said, it's either the dog or me. And she picked him. And she killed her dog. She didn't surrender her dog. She didn't do anything that would be responsible, moral, ethical. Just killed her dog. There's lots of rescues out here, rescue orgs that I run into that do that too. There's a few local ones here in Vancouver that do that. And I know them. I know who they are. And instead of them just trying to help the dog, which is why the heck are they even in rescue? They just cause further death. There's a lack of responsibility. They just, just another number. And to the families that, uh, to the people, should I say, that have dogs, and they're forced with an, uh, uh, an answer from their new partner, should I or should I not keep this relationship going by killing or getting rid of my dog or cat? Uh, I was talking to somebody tonight, and she told me that uh, she has a friend of hers whose dog, uh, sorry, whose cat, um, this person had for t- had for twelve years, started going out with somebody. And he told her, as well as another story, he told her either the cat or me. So she got rid of her cat after 12 years. And then they got a dog. And they had a couple of kids. And when they got the kids, they got rid of the dog. And the couple are not together anymore. That cat would probably still be with her if it wasn't for the selfishness of the partner. Male or female, it doesn't really matter, you know. Selfishness has no sex to it, no gender to it. It's just something that happens, and it's really quite unfortunate. It's the stuff that I um, that I put uh, uh, I'm around. And then there's those people who are losing the most precious things in their life, their their dog that they've are so connected to, who would do anything for one more day, one more day. It's just bizarre. It's just bizarre, this bit of humanity that we exist in. We're, there are so many people out there who are so quick to just say, kill your dog, get rid of your dog, kill your dog. Those people are the ones that contribute to, the, to peer pressure. They're the ones that cause people to kill their dog. Because those same people, have, instead of saying the refrain of kill your dog, if they said... Hey, you know what? Don't kill your dog. Be take care of your dog and do something and help do the, some training or make an accommodation for your dog because it's a life. The world would be a bit different, but these people are the first ones to tell you to kill your dog. It's brutal. I mean, my gosh, how do you, if I went out with somebody and I fell in love with her and she said, "James, you could never help another dog again." It doesn't matter if it was true love and I felt 100% connection to it, like 100% true love, that chasing windmills kind of love, the white picket fence, the leave it to beaver uh, love. I couldn't because my responsibility of love is a selfish desire. My respect for life is what should be driving me. And that's what does drive me. It's heartbreaking. And, and you know, I, I've, I've, I've researched stats, compiled information. Six million dogs are killed annually for behavioral issues primarily. Shelters, owner-directed killings. They're not euthanasia. Shut up with that word, euthanasia, behavioral euthanasia. Euthanasia defined is to put a human or an animal, okay, a human out of prolonged pain and suffering of something that is likely incurable. That's euthanasia. That's, that's mercy. The people who are killing their dog, you got to take responsibility, people. 
You got to take responsibility. Just boggles my mind. The, 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 just take responsibility. One of the things that for me is, is really kind of interesting. I'm going to read a little quote because um, a lot of you know that I have a petition out there to criminalize uh, dog and cat meat in Canada. And I've been very fortunate to have uh, started at the beginning of the year and by the summer already had over 100,000 signatures and had the Honorable Member of Parliament, Ken Hardy, immediately take up the gauntlet and start looking into uh, finding this a law to criminalize because there's no law that exists. And Honorable Hardy has done so and he's told me uh, through his email, um, directly from his private email address, that he will be and hopes to be presenting uh, our petition, those of you are 105, 106,000 signatures now, uh, presenting our petition to the House of Commons this, uh, this winter, uh, hopefully December, maybe January. And one of the things I was fortunate it was to be interviewed by Jade Era. And she has a podcast called Stop You Lin, You Lin, okay? So the, the, a lot of people will have heard about that uh, dog torture festival in, in China. It started around 2009. I've been uh, an outspoken critic of it uh, from 2015, 2016 onward. Um, so much so that I actually got the ire of uh, um, Peter Lee, who is the Asian specialist for Humane Society International, uh, telling me to stop <laughs> calling them out. And he did that on Twitter, which was quite funny. Um, so it's a criminalization of dog and cat meat in Canada. It, it exists. People can do it. They can do whatever they want. You know, I'm, I was going to do a post about uh, today night's vlog in regards to um, this family that adopted a, this this large dog, like I was saying, and, you know, they're in a quandary. So I'll, I'll address it in another time. Uh, I should talk about this petition and talk about Stop You, Lynn. And... It, it's a it's a pretty amazing thing what's happening because we have all these different fractures in animal advocacy globally. We have Vanderpump Dogs, uh, Plush Bear Shelter, Dasm, 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 D A S O M, uh, Nami Kim, Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, Marley's Mutts. We have all these organizations that are out there globally trying to bring shame to those who are torturing dogs to death. And for those of you who don't want to hear this, cover your ears for a few seconds, but they're torturing dogs to death, believing that the adrenaline and all that stuff will make the meat tastier. So they create intense levels of torture where they are literally, cover your ears. For those of you who do not want to hear this, cover your ears. They're cutting the paws off while the dog is still alive and leaving them stapled with a nail gun to, to pulse, so they bleed out over days. They inflict significant deliberate injuries. They will boil them alive, alive. I've seen the videos and thankfully I've never, ex I've been offered to go to China and I've declined because I've got my dog share, but second to anything else is I psychologically could not handle that. And people always say, oh, you know, if I was there, I would stop those people and all that stuff. You're not going to stop a crowd of thousands of people doing what they feel is their righteousness of killing and torturing animals. We're talking golden, we're talking golden retrievers, Pyrenees. We're talking the small little dogs. You see a lot of the, the brown, light brown, fawn colored dogs, the blonde colored dogs, white dogs like Minky because they think the meat keeps their skin and their flesh cooler, these humans. They think it gives them virility. Like what kind of Neanderthal thinks that by torturing, inflicting intense cruelty on another being, on another animal, is something that makes their stomach feel good. This is a selfishness, and it probably explains why the... Uh, Asia is 
literally like a second world country. Doesn't matter how much money China has. It's like a second world country. They're not advanced in any way whatsoever. You know, empathy, evolution, right? Our next, our, our evolutionary trait that I think that humans are pursuing right now, evolutionary wise, because we've gone to physical aspects. We're pretty well at the top of our game. We're doing computers. And, uh, people are, you know, geniuses out there. Tesla, Nikola Tesla, uh, Jane Goodall, um, uh, Elon Musk and all that stuff. The top of, of the top of the, the brains are out there. But what I see happening now in regards to our evolutionary uh, um, progress is empathy. When I was growing up as a kid, I was born in Victoria. When I was growing up as a kid, you know, not a lot of Asians there, a lot of racism. I remember a lot of uh, difficult times, a lot of mean kids, and it doesn't stop. And now as we've evolved over the decades and the centuries, we see this type of discrimination as a negative, and that's an evolutionary trait that we're developing into ourselves to embrace people who are not us, to embrace somebody of a different color, white, yellow, black, brown, to embrace that. And those people we accept. I'm Asian and I'm talking about discrimination here. But we accept these people. And it's incredible how we see in our democratic society as we evolve into frowning upon racism and prejudice. And regardless of what color you are, you shouldn't be subject to racism. And one of, uh, when I, I had a, a retail shoe store um, back in the mid 2000s. And one of the things that I did there was I sponsored and supported a loving spoonful, which is a, um, a, a charity organization that provides uh, f uh, support, dignity, and food to people living with HIV and AIDS. Just something I believe in. When I was a kid, I didn't believe in I would make stupid jokes about people of color that weren't Chinese, uh, which is so ironic, um, and people who loved their own, right? It, it's, it's just stupid. And, and I've grown up and I've matured and I see this. And it's this presence, right? We need to have presence. We need to have consciousness of what's going on in our world. And that's kind of the thing that is an underlying current of what I do in my life and what I do with dogs. And there's no way that I could work with, the, with predatorial giant 150, 170, 183 pound dogs unless I felt that compassion and empathy for them. I see each and every single one of these dogs as a victim of human neglect, abuse, apathy, antipathy, cruelty. Doesn't matter how you describe it or define it or look at the strains of it, cruelty is cruelty. It's how I approach every single dog. Tonight, I was uh, with a dog named Alpha, a white German shepherd, could be a Swiss, uh, a Swiss Shepherd. Beautiful, beautiful dog. He is eight years old, living on a chain in the backyard on cement. So uh, I'm working with the family and uh, one of the family's friends to try to stabilize him because he's reactive to other dogs on leash. And he's got a dangerous dog designation, has to be muzzled, etc. And they can't walk him without him trying to attack other dogs, etc. He's got a prong collar on. They went to two trainers in Richmond. Apparently one has a TV show or something ridiculous like this. And another one. And both of them are saying prong collar, shock collar. And I say to people... You don't need a prong, like for professionals, you don't need a prong collar. You don't need a shock collar. You need to have compassion and empathy and understanding what's going on. 
I was able to walk with the family because this is a dog who doesn't even go out on walks eight years old because he's too wild. He's like 90 to 110 pounds. It's kind of hard to tell his weight. He's a fair sized German shepherd or a shepherd and he's all over the place and he's weaving in and off the sidewalk everywhere, stopping everywhere, sniffing everything. And he's like a child. He's like a little puppy looking at the world again because he doesn't go out. He's literally on a chain connected to a prong collar 24 seven. And it's like what minus two degrees tonight. It's like, what is it? 30 degrees Fahrenheit. He's like, like, and he doesn't even have a blanket to lay on. They've got him a, a, a plastic igloo to sleep in, but there's no, no blanket. And he's got, he's got the callusing right there. I think he's got keratin. He's got that coming up on his elbows. It's, it's just, uh, anyhow, we were able to walk him around the neighborhood. And um, in about an hour and 15 minutes, we we're able to walk him past other dogs across the road because they were taught to zigzag and avoid the dog, other dogs. We we're able to walk with the other dogs on the other side and him having somewhat reaction and the way he was not lunging, but he was jumping up and down on the leash were all indicative of his aspects of processing and emotional insecurity that happens. And it was that easy, no treats, no medication. It was that easy. And then they tell me, this is what the trainer said. And the other trainer said this, and this is what they said to do and all that stuff. And I'm just shaking my head. These are professionals. And I said, here's the thing for a professional to use a, a shock collar, a prong collar, shows their inexperience. Shows that professional's inability to read the dog or proves that that professional is so scared that they're beyond their means. So instead, they use brute force. Shock collar is brute force. A prong collar is brute force. They use that to force a dog into compliance to subjugate the dog into compliance. Like, this is the most <laughs> brutal thing. Every single dog, does not matter how dangerous they are, does not matter how predatorial they are, does not matter if they've attacked people, does not matter if they've killed somebody or an animal. Every single dog can be downtrained without medication, without treats, without anything. I've done it. I've proven it. Google BC Dog Whisperer. You will see these articles confirming everything I say. I don't embellish. I don't lie. I don't make things up to look at myself better than I am. I say the facts, and I never turn down a dog. For the professional, if you don't know the dog is within your capacity, within your skill set, be honorable and just say, you know what, you got to find somebody else. Or your dog is like this, but please try to find some way to make accommodations for them. Maybe find a rescue to surrender to. So it's tough. Um, getting back to this uh, this petition, um, and and Jade Jade did uh, interviewed me in regards to this petition, just to um, you know hear my thoughts on on what I feel is appropriate. Um, in the dog and cat meat uh, trade. Uh, I hate calling it a trade because it still adds some sort of legitimacy to it. And Jody Roth, you know me. You know I've been quite a staunch supporter of the advocacy against this whole uh, horrific trade and all that stuff. Um, so this, this, this interview, I, I put the link up on my Facebook page earlier today. It goes through to... Um, uh, to the YouTube channel for uh, for Stop Ulin podcast. They've just started out recently. Um, uh, I think there's some um, third or fourth episode in uh, of interviews, and uh, you know I talk about what I do and with not just the meat dog trade and and uh, have a lot of insight into that, as well as what I do for work uh, regards to down training dogs. Um, and the, the if you get a chance to take a look, watch this. Uh, interview with me. Um, I've shared it with my petition signatories uh, as well. So hopefully we're going to get some numbers on it. But um, they've interviewed John Daly, who is the founder of Soy Dogs. A lot of you people know who Soy Dogs are. So John Daly, they've interviewed him. They've interviewed Valerie Ianello, 
who is a founder of uh, w, uh, WUFAW, which I can't recall. It's like, uh, it, it's an animal advocacy group, um, but she's also a former director of Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. So that's up on my page. You can take a look at these things and, and see who these people are. Uh, she's, uh, she's also interviewed uh, Nami Kim, Save Korean Dogs, uh, John Vericles, founder of K9 Global Rescue, uh, Vincent Santa for Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation as well, uh, Dr. Barbara uh, Glitlitz uh, for Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation as well, uh, Dr. John Sessa. He's not really a real doctor, like as in a physician. He's a PhD academic. Sorry, I had to say that, John. Um, uh, he's the executive director of Vanderpump Dogs Foundation. Uh, and those of you who know me, Jody, you know, I've, I've, uh, 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 doctor, whatever, John, John has invited me down to Vanderpump dogs before, uh, and Michael Chor, Cor, right. Founder of the sound of animals. So there's a lot of well-known advocates out there that are being, uh, in this stop you uh, podcast. And it just comes down that we, as dog owners collectively need to stop and look at the disparity of what we see globally. And there are people who say, oh my gosh, I can't stand looking at these photos and I can't deal, I can't deal with this and uh, I hate it and I, I, I'm friending people. And it's like your own selfishness to protect yourselves. And I don't, you know, I'm sorry if I offend people, but it's your own selfishness to protect your own sensibilities and your own feelings and your own hurt. It's, are you saying that it outweighs more than a dog being tortured to death? You don't want to look at the horrible pictures because if you cover your eyes, you don't see it like the little three-year-old child that says, I cover my eyes. My mommy and daddy can't see me anymore. I'm invisible. Right? I talk about compassion. It's that loss that we have somehow disconnected with reality because we want to protect ourselves. We have that, that the acronym, uh, acronym uh, NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. I used to get criticized by people who, when I would bring in a dog in from another country, why don't you take care of the dogs here? They're suffering. No, they're not being tortured. They're not being boiled alive. They're not being eviscerated alive slowly to, to die over days. There's... Some of the stuff that I've seen, which is readily available online, is just horrific. Absolutely horrific. Uh, people, uh, these horrible dog butchers will, will cut open a pregnant dog and just throw the puppies, still alive, onto the ground to die. That's Asia for you. And it happens in Africa where they have the rite of passage, where the young man become a young boy, the boy becomes a man. And he, one of the things that to, to have that rite of passage happens is to tear apart a dog alive. In the Middle East, when they call C-U-L-L, when they call the, the stray population, they catch the dogs and because bullets are expensive, so they inject them with bleach. Mexico, countries like that, they put out a notice. We are going to be killing dogs. Make sure your dog is not out on the streets because if your dog's out on the street, they will be shot and then they just kill. Puerto Rico, before the, 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 the um, hurricanes and all that stuff, they had a stray population of 300,000 dogs with about 50% of those dogs, 150,000 dogs being killed annually. So it's brutal. In Canada, up in the north, in the reserves and all that, they will go around with spray paint and they'll spray paint any dog that they see. And then the next day, they go out and kill them. That's Canada. The world I live in, Well, uh, Mary, that's, yeah, and I believe that too. Uh, Mary wrote down and read a story about a girl that was mad at her grandmother, so she cut her grandmother's dog's head off. So 
for us who live in Western society, democracy, we have that like, hey, we have ultimate power and control over our dogs. We choose whether they live or die. It's not even a question. We choose whether or not they live or die. Like Nero, he died on June 11, 2019, 11.54 a.m. I chose the time of the day and roughly the time of his death. I killed him. He's 13 years, seven months, one week old. I killed him because he was old. He, he couldn't walk anymore. I had to carry him in and out of my home, uh, the house that I'm renting, physically carry him. 100 plus pounds, like he's 110, 115 pounds at the time, I would carry him in and out of my, my place, into the backyard, put him on a, on a mat and help him pee by expressing his bladder. I would help him defecate by putting on gloves and helping him defecate. And I did this for months. And he was still able to walk at times. So whenever he needed help, I did. And then I would go while he's laying outside on the mat because I didn't want him laying on the grass and ground because, you know, I want him to be comfortable no matter what. He needs dignity. And then I'd go in and I'd wash the bowl for water. And I'd bring it out to him and all the other dogs would go, oh, water, fresh water. And they'd want to have water. I'd be like, nope, Lincoln, uh, nope, Nero goes first. Everything was like that. I had a wagon for him. Everything. My last, uh, my first Great Dane, Lincoln, my beloved Lincoln, wheelchair he became paraplegic wheelchair incontinent he was defecating uh, loose bowels uh, eight to nine times a day i was cleaning him up all the time and the person i was going out with she was helping as well uh one of my friends was coming in helping when i was off uh working and all that stuff right everyone understood this this the value of life when you see something that says as ridiculously weak and desperate as the term behavioral euthanasia, behavior, euthanasia, behavioral euthanasia. That's the scapegoat. That's a pathetic excuse. It's the, it's the professional saying, the, the, my colleagues saying, I don't know what's wrong with your dog because I'm inept, inexperienced, or unskilled. So instead of me accepting the responsibility that I don't know what to do with your dog, I'm going to blame your dog and say your dog is too crazy and wild. And so it's behavioral. And the only way, because he's not happy, then you should kill your dog because it's behavioral euthanasia, put him out of his misery. That's a professional saying that. That's where the term came from, from professionals, behavioral euthanasia. Go talk to Dr. Rebecca Ledger. Go talk to Dr. Claudia Richter here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Ask them about behavioral euthanasia and then say, why is that such a scapegoat term for you guys? Dr. Ian Dunbar, he's got that bite level scale that the APDT, Association of Professional Dog Trainers, follows bite level four, bite level five, bite level six, behavioral euthanasia. There's a scapegoat. These are people who don't know what the heck they're doing. None of these people could handle any of the dogs that I work with, not a single one. And I know that because Tonka was turned down by every dog, master dog trainer, PhD behaviors in North America contacted by the Southampton Animal Shelter. Everyone turned him down. Too dangerous. He will kill me or he will end up killing somebody on my staff. That's what they all said. And I've talked about this before and I just want to keep saying the proof. Every single dog can be downtrained. And these professionals who are using the brute force devices or who are blaming the dog with behavioral euthanasia, all they're doing is protecting their reputation. All they're doing is protecting their ego. All they're doing is protecting their bank account. Because if you go to a trainer that says, I'm the best in North America, and then you bring him your dog, and your trainer has two choices, that if they can't handle your dog, they have two choices. One is saying, I can't handle your dog, or two, your dog's a problem. Scapegoat. I've never turned down a dog, and I never will. Bring me any dog. You look at my videos, Axel, the German Shepherd, muzzled, attacked his own family, bit them in the face, two of them in the face. Never turned down a dog. And I triple dog dare anybody who thinks I can't do it because bring me a dog.
life is precious, people. Hmm. Um, so I'm just kind of kind of go back to kind of like who I am. Uh, there's a, a comment in um, the Facebook group, Montreal, stop you, Lynn. Montreal, stop you, Lynn. And um, one of the people, uh, Eddie, uh, uh, her name is Eddie, or Edie, sorry, Edie. Uh, uh, last name is spelled G-E-G-O-L-I-C-K. Um, and she actually wrote down because they were uh, uh, sharing about my uh, interview and uh, Eddie Edie says, you know, Jade Era, thank you for featuring James Chai in a podcast. Not only a superb canine behavioral expert, James is a personable, engaging person who only cares for the well-being of all animals, fighting for their rights in ways that count. This man had zero ego, and she puts out in capital letters, zero ego, and I applaud him for staying true to his humble nature. He's a man of integrity and a great warrior for our beloved companion animals. I will always put the dog ahead. I will always put the cats ahead. I will always put alpacas, animals ahead. It does not matter. I will do so. It doesn't, I could have worked the system like these other professionals out there making themselves greater than they are and coming out with behavioral euthanasia. I could have worked the system and sucked up to the group of uh, cliques, the, the little, the little gangs of people and trainers and behaviors that are like that who wanted the reputation and looking how incredible it is that they are and at the end of the day they're killing 40 percent of the dogs they only have a 60 percent success rate at that nothing has changed the way that i am ever anybody who knows me i've stuck to my moral and ethical and in, in, in my position integrity i've stuck to it from absolute day one Back in 2015, when I started focusing on the meat dog trade, I've never strayed from anything that I've ever done, including now. We'll continue doing this to help save dogs' lives absolutely no matter what. I mean, it, otherwise, it's just silly of me to, to compromise who I am. And you know, a person who I have to say is just as admirable is Zach Scal from Marley's Mutts. He has never compromised who he is and this is a guy who is recognized by the the state of california he does a prison dog training program he's the executive director of training for uh for caesar milan he has been interviewed by tony robbins on his podcast and yes i know tony robbins got the controversy which is whatever slimy um he's met the president of the united states in the, at the White House. And Zach has remained who he has been from day one. This man celebrates the preciousness of his own life. And he pays it forward to other animals and people. You know, he's sponsored by Jockey. He does ads for Jockey. He was in New York in Times Square earlier this year and jockey had him in the background under an advertisement on one of those humongous bill uh, electronic uh, led billboards zach scowls on times square in the thing and the guy is just as nice as the first time i ever met him and he will always be that and that's humility that's putting the dog's lives ahead so uh, yeah, sorry, I just had to get this out today because it's just, you know, and, and those of you who have been following my vlog, you know, every, almost every week I talk about this one way or another because I just want to see these dogs not being killed anymore. And I want to see trainers and behaviorists, my colleagues, my uh, professional out there, stop using behavioral euthanasia. Start admitting if you don't know what you're doing. You know, the treat training aspect of dogs that have dysfunctions, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't exist. Dogs don't use food to communicate. Canines don't use food to communicate. I get trolled all the time. Oh, this, no, then prove it, man. Prove it. Put some academia in front of your, your contention that dogs do use food. That's Minky throwing a bone around. They don't. None of it. 
You'll never see a dog rewarding another dog with food unless it's a puppy to it uh, and its mom, but you'll never see a dog using it. So why would we be using treats to help a dysfunctional dog? It's like giving a drug addict more drugs. It goes back to the times of Ivan Pavlov, 1897, when he published his theory, not a theorem, which is a f established fact, but the theory of a speculative fact. It's speculative fact, oxymoron. And he published about dogs taking treats and behavioral aspects of it, even though he was trying to get to the psychology of humanity. And then that is the time when women couldn't vote. You know what? Yesterday, yesterday was the 100-year anniversary of women being allowed to vote in the United States of America. Last year, people, 100 years celebrating suffrage, celebrating women being allowed to vote in the United States of America. Pavlov goes back to 1897. He goes back 122 years when women couldn't vote, when people owned slaves. And that's what treat training is predicated on. Then we have that being perverted in by B.F. Skinner with his operant conditioning, Beyond Dignity and Freedom, or Beyond Freedom and Dignity, his book, right? And that's where they got the operant conditioning and all that stuff. And then people are like, operant conditioning is the fact, and it works, and blah, blah, blah. But if you, simple, and I, I posted this last week, even the United States government has published articles from Noam Chomsky saying B.F. Skinner is wrong. But the dog training industry continues, predicated, forcing themselves to stand by that belief that treat training dogs works. Behaviorism works by positive conditioning. Your dog is reactive. Your dog is trying to attack another dog. You give them a piece of food? Really? Food is the most sought after resource with animals. It's how they survive. Lions, giraffes, wolves, bears eating food, but we're giving food to a dangerous dog, thinking that it's going to help the dangerous dog not be reactive. Dangerous dog doesn't care. And in some cases, people get bitten by their own dog. But that's a psychological aspect of it in regards to uh, unfamiliarity. So it's just one of these things that just, uh, just banal. Body language experts, when they study their subject, they're watching them in their pristine manner. They're watching them in their natural habitat. They're not saying, here, here's a piece of cake if you, if you fill out this test. They're just getting people to behave normally. That's what dogs have to be to be addressed normally. Dysfunction is dysfunction. It's a psychological disconnect. It's an issue. And I always say this. And nobody, you know, next time you're having a fight with somebody, next time you're having an argument with someone, immediately go and hand them a chocolate bar. Give them a treat. See what they'll do. If it's two guys having an argument, good chance there's going to be a fight. But that's what the industry lives on. And that's what the industry figures out. This dog lives or dies. That's what they live on. Dog doesn't take the treat, still reactive, can't be helped, behavioral euthanasia. You see the scapegoating of it? See the easiness of it all? Watch any of my videos on my YouTube channel. All these dogs that are dangerous and all that, and I have to hype it up so that they look and sound dangerous, but you look at the video and you're like, holy cow, these dogs are off the, off the, off the, off the rack. They're just off the hook. They're just insanely dangerous those are those are the dogs that are recommended for behavioral euthanasia brando the pitbull sheila Begg from dizing pet training center thingamajiggy and her, her her other trainer wanted brando killed and they stood by it they stood by that evaluation report in that video you see a copy of her evaluation report they stand behind that this dog will never be helped in a year this dog should be suggested for euthanasia took me one session one single session no treats whatsoever and that dog lives now 
And that dog is with a, a family. Brando is with a family. If they stuck to what Sheila Begg said, that dog, Brando, would be dead. And that's the difference of taking responsibility. And the, and the fosters are the ones who, who hired me. And they're the fosters are the ones who wanted to work with Brando. They're the ones who wanted to save Brando's life, even though they were told there was no hope even in a year. It took me one two-hour session. I have a rare gift with dogs. Absolutely read dogs at two-tenths of a second. I'm the Bruce Lee of dog uh, uh, of, uh, deconstruct, uh, de destructuring on the psychogenetic aspects of it. I, I read dogs at two-tenths of a second. And so, yeah, I show people what the issues are with their particular dog, the dysfunctions. I explain to you why your dog is dysfunctional. And then what happens is you go, okay, now it makes sense. Now I understand through empathy and compassion why my dog is not happy, why my dog is dysfunctional, why my dog wants to kill other people. So I explain it to the, to the humans, to the parents, to the owners, to the fosters. And then I teach them how to do what I'm doing. And I teach them what to see in their dog and the nuanced behaviors, those the tiniest little behaviors and the blinking and so forth. Like I did with Hoagie, who uh, Matt, Chun, Chun, Matt Chun's dog, when he sent the video off of Twitter, you can see how he has a right eye blink on it. All these things that people don't normally catch or they dismiss as like oh, just a dog being dog or just an, it's an anomaly or if it's just a whatever, something in his eye. It's not. All these things mean things. Tell behavior. All these things mean things. Hackles in the front and the back raising. Uh, full hackles raise. Full mohawk, right? The, it's all raise. Pelo erection. It's conscious and subconscious rooted in those behaviors. And every single thing, when you put it all together, puts the pieces together, and then it gives me the psychological profile of your dog. And then it makes sense of all their movements. And then I tell the humans, the parents, this is it. You see this? This is what's happening. Here it is. This is what's happening. Make an adjustment to your voice. Turn the tone of your voice, the, the, the key of your voice. Make adjustments so that your dog hears it better. And they do it. So I lead people and I teach people what I'm seeing. And in one session, they go, okay, cool. Adopt the simplicity of what I'm teaching them and they do it themselves. And the main thing that I focus on is the love that's there between the parents and their dog. I would die for a dog. I have been alone for weeks on end working with predatory dogs in some, uh, inside my home, like Tonka. Times where I did not know I could reach my phone in time. And, and even if I did get attacked, would I be able to even dial 911 with blood all over the place? And would I bleed out? It's constant, constant freaking fear that I experience every single day. Same with Nero, every single day. Constant, absolute fear. I'm afraid of every single dog that I work with. It doesn't matter if people say, this is really friendly to people. I'm still afraid they're going to turn around and bite me in the face. Not in the neck, not in the throat, but in the face. And I understand why some professionals feel threatened and afraid, and that's understandable. But please be humble and admit if you don't know what's going on. Please do not try to protect your ego and blame the dog. Absolutely no reason for anyone professional to blame the dog. You're hired by the humans, by the parents to help their dog. The last thing they want to hear from someone who calls themselves the best of their city or whatever, the last thing somebody wants to hear is your dog's a problem and you should kill your dog. They didn't just hire you and spend a couple hundred, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand, fifteen hundred dollars to be told that your dog can't be helped and to be killed. Absolutely impossible. Let me just see here. Madison, uh, I've actually never really thought about the whole treat training thing. It really doesn't make sense when you think about it. Uh, Mary Crawford, a place open where people can pay and go in to play with wolves. I feel this is stupid. If it's a bite happened, it will be the wolves' fault. Um, Madison, absolutely regards to 
the tree training part of it. You think about it. It doesn't make sense. If your child is having a temper tantrum at the toy store and they've thrown themselves on the floor and they're just freaking out because they want a toy, would you buy them the toy? Would you give them the treat? That toy is the treat. Would you give that to them? Or would you be a parent and say, no, you're not getting it. You can have a temper tantrum and we'll just leave the store. We'll sit in the vehicle. You can calm down and we'll go back into the store. And if you're still upset and having a temper tantrum, we're not going to buy you the toy. Or we're not going to give you anything. We're not even going to go. We're going to leave the toy store. How do you get that message across? You're not holding the toy in front of you. Go saying to you, the kid having the temper tantrum in the car, you're saying to them face to face, hey, this is what you need to do. I want you to behave when we're inside the store. You're going to talk to that child. You're going to explain to your child, this is the issue. This is what you need to do. You're not negotiating. You're setting rules. You're setting the boundaries. And then you follow that through. Uh, thank you, Sheena. Uh, Sheena says, words said by a wise man. You know, I, I work hard to try to leave a digital legacy. And I've got almost all my equipment now for podcasting, vlogging. I'm just waiting for a lighting kit to show up next week sometime. I'll have to go across the border. Uh, but I've got my video camera and I've got, uh, you know, a new laptop, you know, the quality, right? And then I'll start working on these things to go on. Um, I never want to be on a pedestal. I just want people to, to listen to what I'm saying and think about it and realize that it actually is truth. It's not things that come from somebody who's gone to some school to learn how to dog train, who's told by the teacher, if the dog bites you, then that dog can't be helped and has to be killed. Who wants to go to a school where the outcome is death? <laughs> like, really? Everything I learned was by the seat of my pants. Everything I learned was being alone. I had nobody to back me up. I lost a lot of friends. People wouldn't want to come over to my home anymore because they were afraid that they were going to get attacked. And it's not like as if getting attacked by a, a, a chihuahua or, you know, it's, not, it's getting attacked by a dog that has a 700 PSI bite strength whose head is bigger than mine. Let me just see this thing here. Uh, I'll show you a photo. I mean, right. So this is this is Tonka. I'm five foot eleven. Oops, if we can see this here. Uh, sorry, this is horrible. This sucks. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> Anyways. You, you, let's just see if we can cover this up. No, it doesn't help. Okay. But you can see the, the, the top of the door. I'm five foot eleven, And he's not even really stretched out. And I know there's a great Dane that is over seven feet, six inches tall now. He's, he, uh, Tonga's six feet, probably six inches. He's at least six four because that's as far as I could see. He's attacked 16 people. Dragged a shelter worker and all these absolute things absolutely despises humans, especially men. Because every man that he had out of the six out of seven homes beat him. We're all guys. Everyone said that there's no way that, that Tonka could, could be trained, down trained. And I did it. And it took a long time, but I did it. And if we're just patient with what's going on, right? Like I talk about in, in all my vlogs at the end of it, I try to talk in most of them is like, if you're talking to somebody on the phone and they're talking about something that you just don't want to hear anymore because they always repeat it, give them an extra 12, 15, 20 seconds. Give them some extra time and patience. I have people who contact me after working with their dog and they're like, oh, my dog's broken again. My dog's not fixed. Well, have you been doing the work? And they're like, no. Or, well, I thought he was fixed. No, go back to step one, go back to square one, do the homework. There's no magic trick that happens with dogs. 
the work that I do looks like magic, but it's not magic. It's really just connecting and just viscerally, viscerally within your heart and your soul connecting. I fall in love with your dog. And I fall truly in love with your dog because only from the point of wanting to help and wanting to, to, to heal can I truly help your dog. It's the only way. It's like the Good Samaritan. No, it's like the person that goes out there and helps other people. There's no difference. And this is what we all possess inside of us. Minky. Hi, Minky. Hi, Minky. This is what we all possess inside of us. Minky. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Okay, Minky's out here. So just, just realize that life is precious. Today is Friday, Friday night. Some of us are going to hang out at home. Some of us can go out and party, you know, and then we have the weekend to, to relax. Think about these, the most amazing thing that you have. Compassion, kindness. It doesn't just have to be with our dogs only. It has to be with our humanity. You know, I kind of think about it in that now that I'm trying to make a, some, a joke out of this uh, or a little bit of humor out of it is that, you know, usually I'm on a rant. I'm usually on a rail and something like this that have happened in this past week of all these dogs being killed would normally put me into a, a rant and a rail, but that's not, is not going to help. Find compassion, find your soul, find that heart inside of you. It doesn't matter if you believe in God or Muhammad or Jebediah, doesn't matter who you believe in. Find your soul. Even if you're agnostic or you don't believe in anything and you're spiritual, find your soul. And I write soul with a capital S every time because then it means something to me. It pronouns it. It means something. I respect that part of myself. I respect that part of somebody else. You know, if I five years ago, I probably wasn't as uh, um, introspective as I am now. But I needed to learn. I needed to change the things about me that were detrimental and negative in my life. And to get rid of things that weren't working out for me and to look what was making me really happy. You know, I was working, a, I was doing car transport, delivering high value vehicles, making really good money, like really good money. And I walked away from it so I could help dogs. A choice. Will I, will I be seen in history as someone who, who made the right decision? I don't know and I don't really care. All I know is this is what I'm doing for dogs. All I know is that you have it inside of you. Every single one of you has that compassion inside of you. And it doesn't matter if you want to joke about it or be flippant about it or whatever. When you look inside yourself, when you stand in front of the mirror in the bathroom and you're doing your makeup or you're combing your hair, stop for a few seconds and just look in your own eyes. It's hard to do. It's really hard to look at yourself. But do that more so. And you're going to find that little child inside of you that you dreamed of. Biggest, most incredible, loving dreams in the changing of the world. You're going to see that inside of you. And then you're going to learn whether or not you found that happiness inside of you. And if you haven't found that happiness inside of you, because I used to look in the mirror and be like, this sucks. But when you look inside of that and you find that happiness inside of you, that's when your dream starts. It didn't disappear. It didn't fade away. It starts. And look at what it is that you can do within reason. Look at these incredible motivational aspects within inside of you yourself to achieve and to thrive and to build up and to be inspired by yourself. Don't worry about anybody else trying to help you or make you great or famous. 
I can count on two hands how many people have told me that they would help me do a TV show, that they would do this and that. On two hands, over 10 people have said that to me. Some well-known people. But it's just the flavor of the month sometimes for people like this. So you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be worried about it. Just do what you're still doing. I'm doing these podcasts. If you see my first one, September 24th, my, my first episode, I'm nervous. My voice is shaking. Now I'm a bit more present here. I'm trying to get the guts now to be able to stand and do my podcast, which is what I have been kind of procrastinating. And that's why I haven't done any formal podcasts lately because I'm a chicken. I'm afraid of standing because I feel more nervous standing. Talking in front of people. I'm talking to you all here and it's still nerve wracking for me. What is my goal is to leave a digital legacy. What my goal is to follow my dream, my own dream. I didn't know what it was when I was growing up. I always thought I was going to be Bruce Lee, number two. And I took Wing Chun, same martial arts Bruce Lee. I did pretty well everything that Bruce Lee did. I could do two finger push-ups when I was young and in shape. <laughs> didn't make me happy. But now I pursue what it is that I, I have. And that's what you all have inside of you. Every single one of you has that inside of you. Those of you who have watched till the end here, an hour plus, you have this inside of you. Look at yourself in the mirror. When you're brushing your teeth, just look at yourself. S don't stare at yourself. Just look at yourself and look inside your eyes. Look inside your eyes. Look inside your eyes for that little child that had those most amazing, gorgeous dreams. You know, those absolutely incredible dreams. Rock climbing, firefighter, change the world. And just scale it to where you are today and find a way to follow that dream again. No matter if it's 1% of what it was before, follow that. You have it inside of you. I'm living proof for what I'm doing. And I'm not successful, but I'm fulfilled beyond anything in my life. I have never reached such a contentment in my life. And the power and the talent and the gift that I have with dogs is what myself I can do. And I'm teaching people. So that means they have it themselves. So it's not just my gift. It's people who have their own gifts and they're learning it and they're realizing this love that they have and they feel much more happier about the whole life. Just what I'm following, you all can do it yourselves. This incredible compassion inside of us as humans is so gorgeous. The people that we love and we trust, we can be free and crazy and talk about our dreams. You know, this is the most beautiful thing that I love doing with somebody that I'm going out with is to be able to stand or sit or, st or whatever and just talk about anything and everything till the sun comes up. That connection. The notebook, right? You know, that movie. My favorite scene out of The Notebook is when Ryan Reynolds, oh no, oh, sorry, uh, Ryan Gosling. Sorry, I always confuse the Ryan's, uh, Ryan Gosling character and the, uh, I can't remember the other woman's name. The Ah, uh, my gosh, I forgot her name. But that scene when they're still in the small town and they're eating ice cream with the ice cream cone, for those you remember, that's the most gorgeous, gorgeous moment between two people in love. And that's soul-based love. And they die at the end and all that stuff. And it's gorgeous. For, uh, spoiler alert or whatever. If you haven't seen The Notebook after these decades, then there's something wrong <laughs> with your heart, right? I mean, I've got, you know, it would always kind of drive me nuts when I would date somebody and I would say, uh, what movies do you like? And we talk about these movies and these movies. And I say, oh, yeah, you know, I also like romantic movies. I like The Notebook and uh, Love Actually and, and, and uh, you know, The Joy Luck Club and all these movies. And then they would always almost, like some of them, not almost always, because uh, some actually did. They would say, I've never seen The Notebook. I said, oh, my gosh, it's one of the best romantic true love movies ever in the thing. And, I, and they would say, well, I just never found it interesting to watch. And then to me, it was like, oh my gosh, what a, what a life to have 
never had the experience of seeing two people in love because that means we ourselves don't know it. We're strangers to that love ourselves. And that's a disservice to us if we haven't found true love in ourselves and true love with others, with our dogs, with our friends, family, true love. True love doesn't mean sex. True love means being with that person in such a gorgeous embrace that I can finish your sentence, true love. The let's sit here on the beach and hold hands and watch the sunset in silence, true love. The forgiveness and the love and everything about us, right? That all comes from who we were as children, the dream and the passion, right? You see kids playing in the playground, playing with each other, and there's a kid, you know, that's not being included. And then somebody will come over, then another kid will come over and bring them into the group to play. We see that happening before we get all clouded up with our own selfishness. Everything that I'm doing, all these podcasts that I'm doing, and when I get into vlogging and I'm going to structure and episodics, everything like that is all going to be for free. So I'm going to explain to people down the road how dogs process time through abstract memory. I'm going to explain to people what tail behavior means. All these things that people charge thousands of dollars Professionals charge thousands of dollars for these courses for things that will never work with dysfunctional dogs. I'm going to share that with the world for free because it's a gift that was given and shared with me. Doesn't make me a, a better person, doesn't make me a great person whatsoever. It's just me doing what's right. I ask of you all to find the passion and the compassion, the little child inside of you that dreamed that most amazing dream. Reconnect, find that absolute gorgeousness inside of you. Connect with yourself. Look at yourself in the eyes. See who you are for the first time in decades. Bring tears to your eyes. Bring tears to your soul. Find that. It is inside of you. And you're going to do the most amazing, gorgeous things, absolutely. And if you find that you falter, send me a message. If you need some help, send me a message. Two broken souls helping each other. Nobody's perfect in this world. You could be the richest person in the world. You could be the poorest. You can find happiness in your soul. Follow your dream. I'm going to let everyone go. Enjoy your Friday night. If you've enjoyed my work, please share my posts. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please help me get my word out. Please help me help save more dogs. We're going to change this world. And those of you who are following my path, you're going to share my dream, leaving a digital legacy. And I am the most grateful for this incredible gift. And I get to share it with you all. So you get to save your own dogs. So we can reduce the 6 million dogs being killed. We just got to land a hand to someone for those few seconds that they need it from us. Thank you, everyone, for following. Thank you for watching. Have an incredibly beautiful Friday night. Enjoy yourselves. Follow your dream. Not dreams, but follow your dream. Find your inspiration. Reconnect with your child. Good night.